So, Paul, your thoughts on the on the Empower 150 in the in the subset of the EGFR population? Right. It's certainly a compelling set of data, and particularly in uh, the space that we're navigating now, where most patients are in the post osimertinib space, and and we don't have that kind of reliable next thing as we did when patients were in the post erlotinib first line setting. It's compelling. I think for me. Um, the adoption has been less uh, robust in part because of the clinical trial portfolio that we have in that space for molecular testing at the time of resistance mm -hmm. and all of the work that's going into that. Mm -hmm. There is a subset of patients where I do worry about um, a couple of things, and one of them has to do with you know, the clonal population that's still maybe being suppressed by osimertinib and the desire to elide the osimertinib. This is sort of an older technique, right, uh, with erlotinib. Um, the uh, osimertinib, until that first response scan on chemo to prevent that flare from occurring, you know, at Memorial were big sort of proponents and believers of that. And with the tox data, right, behind, as Heather had mentioned, behind osimertinib and immunotherapy, that, that's a big issue and reservation um, in terms of its, its adoption. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that it is compelling and one of the more compelling things that we've seen in that space. I think the tox data is a bit more pertinent for uh, checkpoint followed by the TKI and a little bit less worrisome. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least one uh, trial looked at uh, immune-related toxicities and uh, um, I think it included your shop, uh, but it was a m number of different uh, institutions and that the sequence has some bearing on uh, Right. This, this is in reference mm -hmm. to TATIN, yeah. where mm -hmm. they yeah. were doing, right, osimertinib combined with Oh, combined. Oh, no, no, Right. No, no. And so that, yeah, that, so that elision, mm -hmm. if you're eliding, you, you can't elide osimertinib with a tezolizumab, for example, is an issue within the context of mm -hmm. uh, Empower 150. So we've talked a lot about Keynote 189. We would all agree it's practice changing. It's an impressively positive trial. We don't talk much about Empower 132, which was essentially the same trial um, with as a tezolizumab. And so in my mind, we have one positive trial and one negative trial. How, how, do, how, does, how does the panel feel about that? Does that do, you, do we dismiss 132 or do we say, hmm? Maybe Keynote 189 is really better than it really is, <laughs> and maybe Empower 132 is, 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 may not be as good as it is. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Right, I, I think the, the question of, is one of these drugs not like the others, That's is the not an yeah. easy question to answer, <laughs> like I think. Like old Sesame Street, right? uh, um, one of these uh, ages, right. one of these IOs is not like the other. Um, I think in, until we, which we may never have a head to head, I think it's, we have to be very cautious in trying to make those cross-trial comparisons. That being said, when I'm combining immune therapy with chemotherapy, when it's carboplatin pemetrexid, I'm giving pembrolizumab, right. right? And if I'm giving an Empower 150 type regimen, it's a tezolizumab. And if I'm giving NAB paclitaxel, carboplatin, and AN agent, it's pembrolizumab in my few squamous, squamous patients where I've done that. But yeah. if you had a non-squamous patient who, for whatever reason, isn't a candidate for pemetrexid, perhaps uh, some degree of renal insufficiency, mm -hmm. That's where I was going we do there, have so. phase three data with mm -hmm. the TESA that's yeah. positive. Yeah, and then I would in do Power that also. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 In Power 130. Yeah, in Power 130 I will mm -hmm. in that setting also. Corey, you, what, what percentage of your patients are not eligible for pemetrexid? For pemetrexid? Yeah. I'd guesstimate uh, 15 to 20 percent. You know, we have to be intellectually honest. Uh, we have an older patient, 75, 80 years of age, female, weighs 100 pounds, 110 pounds, and has an ostensibly normal creat at 1.2, 1.3. I can guarantee you their creatin clearance is below 45. And you go back to the package insert for Pemetrex, it's 45 or higher. Not that you can't give it, it's just that. Uh, virtually all of the clinical trials that tested it mandated that minimum uh, EGF, uh, glomerular filtration rate as opposed to EGFR. And um, uh, the pharmacokinetics are very unpredictable and very variable below 45. If you run into trouble with this drug, it's in that population. And, uh, you know, much as I'd rather not cause hair loss or neuropathy, a taxane, particularly a taxane that's given weekly, is probably a bit safer. And I, we have phase three data. 